So the big question in everybody's mind, can everybody hear me? Great. So is, what's a CNO, right? It's a chief innovation officer. It's uh, the best job you want when you're outside the company because you really give all your developers a hard time. So thank you for coming. Let's start with top four questions and answers on the board. Uh, 1990s movie, Big Red Stapler. Whew, perfect. Office space. All right, now it's my survey questions. Who's here out of curiosity? Great. All right. Who's heard it before? A couple people, great. And here's the big one, ready? <laughs> Go ahead, raise your hands. I want to see the pressure. Oh, awesome, thank you so much. <laughs> so, um, you might ask yourself, okay, this is a business continuity conference. What's it got to do with biology? Right? Lizard brain, business continuity. And actually, it all started with me um, probably about 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, I was at a conference uh, for higher education. I was speaking there, and uh, the, the keynote was a futurist, you know, talking all about the future. And the essence of his conversation, now it was 10 years later, and what I remember from that conversation is what he was talking about is, is learning and how we learn. And one of the things that he mentioned was, you know, who here watches the news? Right? Okay, right? Everybody, for the most part, or listens to it. And what he was saying is on the news, it's usually 10 bad stories to every one, because it's all about ratings. And what that does is instill fear in us. And fear relates back to the lizard brain. And the lizard brain has basic instincts. And what he was relating it back was to, to the caveman, which is when there was fear, the brain would shut down, and it, all, all the energy and blood would go to your extremities to run. So his analogy was the brain make, that the news makes you stupid. <laughs> now, I walked away with, uh, OK, I get that. And I stopped watching the news after that. <laughs> But it really was all about the lizard brain. And, and I was thinking about that. And uh, have you ever heard of Seth Godin? So here's a great quote from Seth. Um, I actually saw him speak. And uh, it wasn't on the purple cow. But I really thought this was a really good way to, to build a presentation. And, I, and we have actually built our professional services around this, which, all right, nobody leave. And, and what it is, it's all about adrenaline. Now, right now, I can't promise you that you're going to have an adrenaline rush from this presentation, but I am going to hope <laughs> that you've had your coffee. So let's, let's get into that biology lesson. So, uh, by the way, I, I am qualified to speak on this. If you looked at my grades in college for biology, they were cumulative. My cumulative was cumulative, I think it was 1.23. But it's okay now, my son's in med school, so we're good. So the outer brain, that, that's called the neocortex. That's the human brain. We see some really you know, rational thinking. You're, you're going to see higher level processing. Emotions. Creativity. Now think to work. Anybody at work that you know that might not have a neocortex? Is, my, is Frank in the room, boss? <laughs> no, good. OK, so from the neocortex, it's now the mammalian brain. Right? That's all mammals. What do we see in, in mammals? Sociability, maternal love, emotions. All right? Tell me you guys did not think the same person is also lacking in those skills in the mammalian brain. Anybody know who this is? Carl Sagan, his famous saying, billions and billions of years ago, was the lizard brain. Well, let's take a look at the lizard brain. It's the core. 
theory of evolution, we've all evolved from that. That was the futurist speaker, even Seth Godin, all talks about that lizard brain. And it's also called the dinosaur brain, but I've worked with enough of them in my career that I'm just going to kind of avoid that term if that's okay. I'll just stick with lizard. Basic, right? It's all basic emotions, basic feelings. Hunger, right? Thirst. You guys waiting to see what I'm using for reproduction, aren't you? <laughs> Again, reproduction, it's, it's innate in us. Territorial. And fight or flee. All built into the lizard brain. So you're probably wondering, hmm, okay, I get it so far, but how does it relate? How does it relate to what we do on a daily basis? Well, that lizard brain travels at the 500 times faster than the speed of thought. So even before you've thought it, you've felt it, and you've reacted to it. It is that innate in us. So when you think about it, I'm not even thinking, I'm reacting. And when you look, what's the difference between perception and reality? <laughs> At this point, right, nothing. Now that's great if you're salmon swimming upstream to, to spawn and die, but when it comes to humans, again, back to that instinct of running from the saber-toothed tiger is great, but how does it impact us in a real disaster? There we go. I can't get too far away. So let's take a look at that, because it's a point to ponder. How do I build those, and where does that come in? So what we've looked at is the, I'll call it the de-evolution of the human brain. From the lizard brain to the mammalian brain. So now let's look at plans. There's a parallel path here. So if I look at the de-evolution, as we did the brain, there's different types of plans. I've got that compliance, regulatory, handbooks, the GOMs, and again, the down to the lizard brain. Let's, let's dissect each one at a real white level. Compliance and regulatory. Is there anything I've missed on, on that big, huge binder that we have or used to have? No? I got it right? Wow. So who's the audience for compliance and regulatory plans? Exactly. Internal, external auditors, regulators, they're the ones that just love those big, thick binders. Next is handbooks. So the handbook is usually a scaled-down version, right? It's something we're going to use internally. Maybe a lighter version of the compliance. It's got a lot more, a little bit of it, less information wrapped around it, but it's still there. So those are my handbooks. So it was kind of funny. I was uh, <clears throat> at a client in Philadelphia, and uh, facilities was running the um, business continuity disaster recovery for them. And I said, "Hey, can we take a look at your plans before we get started?" He goes, "Yeah, sure." Come on down to my office. The facilities is definitely, he's outside the boiler room. Behind his desk is this. I said, and when we're talking, I'm figuring he's going to pull something out from his desk. And he goes, um, hold on a second. Oh, here it is. That was their handbook plan. We changed that, but <laughs> I, I thought, how am I going to, how is that actionable? How is that resilient? How am I going to cover from that? And lastly is the GOM. Starts off, it really was 
either a compliance or the handbook plan. In fact, there may be very little variation in a GOMB. And you know what, as the department, you know, we've given it to the department, let them update their plans. You know, we're, we're, we're too busy, we're, we're working, it's really hard, let them update it. And yeah, we definitely need it for compliance, but what's happened is it's been handed down or off from subject matter expert internal to that department to subject matter expert. And, and a lot of it gets lost in translation. Yes? Can I, oh, you want me to define GOM? You don't know what GOM means? <laughs> Get off my back. You know? I mean, really, you know, when you give them the plans and you're saying, okay, they're due, give them back to me? Yeah, let me, let me scribble another paragraph on something that somebody did four years ago. Go here, get off my back. Thanks, I'll pay you for that later. That was a good lead-in, thank you. <laughs> so that gets us to the crossroad. Lizard brain and business continuity. Remember, real disaster. We want plans to be actionable, resilient, and still stay within that compliance factor. Oh, and, and in a disaster, where do we turn? First thing we do is flip up abc.com or NBC or CBS or CNN.com. So we're already focused, and I don't care who we are, right? If you think to any disaster that you've been through, that's the first place we turn. Right? All right, it's disaster time. It's probably what's going through our minds, right? Everything up there is going through our minds right now. What's going on? Oh, remember, oh, that's right. Oh, our business continuity plans, we've we, we got we to work on those. Right? I've got to overcome that speed of thought 500 times faster. How am I going to do that? So, of course, every presentation has to have a quote from a historical figure. I actually thought this one was great. I think it fits in well. Hey, plans are worthless. And planning is everything. So let's take a look at the lizard brain. There's some nice guidelines. They're actually pretty easy to follow. We want them, again, they've got to be highly actionable. We've got to overcome the fear instinct. That's our, that's our main goal here. They've got to be resilient. We've got to be able to use them and recover from them. So make an assumption. I, I, I've gone into a client, just standard operating procedures was 47 pages. Oh, and it was written for my dog. Why? Because it had pictures and diagrams of how they do everything on a daily basis at a granular level. That's a handbook. That's not anything towards building a, a recoverable operation. We want to keep it at high-level steps. Almost like reminders, right? Think instinct. Think reminders. Yes? So what's your opinion of having a run-door, for example, moving that circle arrows, pictures, in case you have somebody who's, you know, not on the other side of the bridge? Okay. Uh, great question. So what, what happens if that run book and the SME is hit by a bus, other side of the bridge? going to get there? That is a great question. So for reminders, a little side story. Um, my wife and I are, uh, these are uh, American Britneys, and we do foster. And these are our two foster failures, which means they never left the house. So if, you, if you're ever familiar with the breed, they're extremely intelligent. They are constant ADD, high energy dogs. And they're hard, they're so intelligent, they actually are hard to train at first. So um, what we've done, and let's see if this works, is they have training collars on that are good for a mile, thank goodness. And I have a, 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 a remote, and what it does, it's a reminder, it sends a vibration to their neck. So when you give them a command and they're chasing a deer, half a mile away, and you call them, it's like, oh, oh, okay, and they'll come back. So it's a reminder, and no, they are illegal for kids. I did find that out. 
Yes, crisis management team and your compliance officer, I have them for sale in the back. <laughs> so when you look at disaster, think of all the things that are going through our head, what happens? We freeze. So how do we overcome all of that noise, that churn that's around us on a daily basis, let alone in doing a plan? The loser brain. It, we do the five by five rule. Right? It's, it, it's a really easy thing to remember. And I'd say over about 200 clients, it holds true, with some exceptions. So what are we going to do? We're going to identify the resources we needed, support components, whatever we need to do that. We'll talk about that. But here it is. On average, a true business department, little asterisk, right, has between one and five high-level business processes. Now, when we kick off engagements, we actually say that at the kickoff meeting. What happens? Their brains are now thinking, how do I roll everything up into one in five processes? And they're very successful at doing that. It works extremely well. Second piece of that. If you take a business process, it can be dissected down on average between one and five high level steps. Actionable, resilient, easy to manage, easy to maintain. So the first rule of five, uh, and of course, I had to find something Disney, right? <laughs> so you take a look at the identify. What are your, what are your five high-level processes? And again, when I say true department, a lot of companies will do aggregates and call a department something, and it's actually three or four different true departments that are aggregated up. That's probably the hardest challenge here. So I did finance, right? Here's, yeah, I, and I just took it from a, from a sample. Here's my five high level. Would you guys say that's about right? You can say no, I'll just ignore you. <laughs> okay, so great, we've got it. That's good. By the way, it makes it a lot easier to do a BIA on five functions for a department than 20, doesn't it? And the department appreciates it, and what, do you, what have you lost? If you can instill it up, you haven't lost anything but you've gained the respect of a department that's not spending three hours with you in a BIA. So then we take the second rule of five. Now we're going to dissect that down. So let's take the first one. Accounts payable. What are those five high-level steps? It's okay to have six. It's okay to have three. All right? I get the notification, do the validation against the, against the, uh, the SAP. Boom, going to process it and get it out. So there is an exception, it's, I call it the Ralph rule. <laughs> Two, it's IT. <laughs> and with IT, it usually starts with about seven steps, if you think of a template. Depending on the architecture within IT, it's not going to matter. All right? So to, to your question, is I'm going to reference a pulling a, a, a larger document, right? So my plan, my lizard brain plan, is going to have the high-level steps. Anybody here from IT? So when you think about a, a high-level process with a variation, there's a lot of detail that can be put in here as supplemental information. Yes? So why, why don't I treat it like a business? And again, it's, 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 it's how you treat it. So if you look at SAP or you know, Windows Server, Blade, SAN, this is starts as a guideline. I, I hate the word template. Okay. So then they would be two separate, right? So if you have IT as a business and as DR, you're absolutely right. Yeah. 
Okay, right. So IT is a business as a shared service. Absolutely. I'm looking at it from a recovery plan standpoint. So it, it would apply. No, thank you. <laughs> All right. Now, so we've got our steps. We started the five by five rule. Five process is high level on average. Oh, by the way, bonus round. What department will have 20 processes no matter how hard you try? HR, followed by legal. <laughs> so now we're going to do the assembly of the, of the lizard brain. Those are the list of ingredients. So, and what we do in, in, in an analogy is, hey, you made coffee this morning. Well, we didn't make coffee this morning. But uh, you, know, you make coffee, you get your filter, your coffee, the water, and your cup, and the coffee maker. You get those all together before you even start the five steps. So why not do that in building a BC or a DR plan? Hey, by the way, it makes it all easy if it's all grouped into one step. And usually that, so the rule, the, the, the caveat here, that becomes the first step or sixth step. <laughs> and, and genericize the ingredients. Do I, does the department really care that it's a Dell Latitude 850 or, or a Rico MFD 1027? And what happens when we go replace that? So if you can keep them generic, they're easier to, to manage and maintain that inventory than having to pull it from your asset management system and have them have a look on the back of their, their desktop or their laptop to figure out which one do they have. Because that doesn't make you very popular either. And when you're thinking about it, right? If you get, tell them the first thing you need to do is to get everything together, oh, that's easy. I can do that. That's an instinct. I can get that together. I'm going to succeed and feel a lot more comfortable and take a breath. It is that success up front, right? Because what do we want in a disaster? We want normalcy as fast as possible. That nor it is where we go to. That is why Chick-fil-A is the first restaurant that opens in a disaster, is to bring normalcy back. So if we take a look at that, now I'm going to apply my list of ingredients. I'll put them usually at the top as, as, as a, I'll call it an ingredient step, because everybody can relate to that. So what do I need? I need Outlook, SAP, the office suite. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a client and we look at their, their list from uh, ServiceNow or Remedy, and I see Office, Word 2013, Word 2017, the word Word, what am I picking? That just waters down everything else that I'm doing and creates confusion. I just say the office suite. Do they really care? No. Why would, I, why would the local ASAP care? But what Okay. Customers who forgot to update their contract with us would walk into the machine running Windows 10. <laughs> they were running on Windows 7. They said, well, where is Windows 7? So that's a, right. So the the, you know, the issue here is, we're, we're, you know, our contract says XP for the rest of the people, and it's Windows Seven. So that's a contractual issue. But it, you know, when I'm looking at it from a recovery standpoint, if I it, if I'm on the recovery side and I'm getting laptops, you're, right? You're you're doing a full managed hosting from a SunGuard. Yeah, that's a different story. But I don't. I can't afford SunGuard. So. I'm just going to go and get laptops. I'm going to get 130 of them because I really don't have a service level agreement or a contract. So I'm just going to get what I can to get us over the hump. Absolutely. And that is the responsibility of the DR coordinator to make sure. Yeah, absolutely. But, but from the business side, they don't know. This is the, you know, when we're looking at it from the business, it's, it's what do I need? I need a laptop. I need a multifunction device. Uh, you know, because I may not be able to get a Rico in time. I might have to get a Xerox from the Office Depot and set up our temporary facilities. And for them, I just know I need it. As long as it works, right? Business, as long as it works, I usually don't complain. I said usually. And then anything specialized, embosser, check stocks, microprinter, 
toner. You know, those things that I can't just go to Staples and buy or anywhere. When we look at the benefits of a lizard brain plan, the goal here is to make it agile, easy for the departments to manage, easy to recover. We want to create success. You know, we want the departments to meet with us, or want to meet with us. And they appreciate the approach. Um, I was on the West Coast for a, a healthcare system that we had done some work for. Um, two years previous, and I was doing a board level presentation. And I'm sitting in the CISO's office, and they have a beautiful view in Seattle. And so I'm sitting in his office, and it's glass, and there's a hallway there. And so we're, we're, we're getting ready for the presentation, and there's a knock on his glass. And it was one of the department manager SMEs, and he opens the door and says, hey, Chris, I just wanted to tell you, you should see my lizard brain plan, it's awesome. That's two years later. It's, now, it's not business continuity. So I relate it to this. Who here has life insurance? You don't have to wait, right? Who here has death insurance? Oh, it's the same thing, but would you buy death insurance? No. So it's a recovery plan or a lizard brain, which is funner. <laughs> yes, I did use the word funner. <laughs> so they appreciate the approach. Because it's light, it's a lot less than what they were used to, they can relate to it and it's focusing on them. We're not using any BC terminology in that lizard brain approach. If, if, if you're here to teach somebody something that's not in my, in my wheelhouse, I'm going to roll my eyes back and pick up my phone. So don't teach it to them. They'll learn it as they go. We want that actionable, whether it be a test or disaster, that core plan is what we're going to work from. It's all about success. It's success for us, it's success for the business unit, and more importantly, it's the success for the company that we work for. And I know that, right? Business continuity, fun. It really does. It, it takes that approach that if you're taking it light, they're engaged. They really get engaged, and they get it, because what are we doing? We're talking about them. It's all about them. The focus is now there, right? What do people, what's, the, what's, the, what's the most favorite word that people like to hear? Raise. They're raised. <laughs> That's sec it's their name, right? So what's what we're doing? We're basically using them to talk about themselves. So we've done biology, right? We've looked about biology. Now, now I'm going to give you a lesson in geology. So when we look at the lizard brain, what's that core? It's that standard operating, it's the recovery, resources. Oh, what do I need to recover? That's the core. So think wrappers. Now we can take the handbook. Now it's got my call lists. Ron, to your point, it was all that supporting documentation that if the subject matter expert got hit by a bus or was across the bridge and unable to come in, I can now wrap that around that, the department dots, diagrams. One of the things I always say, and I actually put it in the lizard brain plan now, is an evacuation plan. Go to Google Earth, you get a picture, you put it in Microsoft Paint. I don't know what it is for the Mac, I'm sorry. I'm sure it's easier and faster, though. <laughs> and, and put that in your recovery plan for the lizard brain. Here's where you need to go for evacuation. Compliance, right? So we're still building around the lizard brain. What is the department concerned with? Just the lizard brain plan. Nothing else. It's our job to, to help them support policies, procedures, those type of things. That's the wrappers that we're going to help them with, to put that into a complete, resilient, actionable plan. Questions? Oh, come on. Another cup of coffee? <laughs> Observations? Yes? How can you put your plan in something like a YouTube? Thinking about your lizard brain in the recipe, 
that would, does that sound like it might be? So, you know how you go out on YouTube to see how to do things, and you do that with your plan, your lizard brain. So, great, great. I actually like that idea. Um, so, I, I have a two part opinion, right? There's no answer here, and if I get it wrong. <laughs> Um, so, so one, you have intellectual property and information. And now I'm dependent on another device. So, yeah, I want to be able to get access to my plan, it, and bandwidth is an issue, so that would be one. But um, two to your point, one of the things I use um, is on YouTube, if you, if you um, go on YouTube and search for business continuity, homeland security, I use this in all my board level presentations. It is a two minute and 40 second video uh, from Homeland Security that is, that'll crack you up. And, there, and it goes to the question is, no two plans are the same. So it really makes a hard piece to do from a productivity standpoint. Right, I, so it would be a fun exercise to do. Um, Good, good, luck in, good luck in getting them involved. <laughs> Questions, comments? So, Peter, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess two questions. One, if you can give us some insight into success and failure stories that you've had uh, implementing this. And then two, in, uh, I'm thinking specifically of the financial services industry. <laughs> Does this pass the regulators? Gee, Peter, what a surprise. <laughs> so questions, uh, uh, if I can break that down into two. Let me just put this down. Um, successes, and, and as it relates to regulators, right? That's essentially what it comes down to? Sure. Um, so th this approach has been fine-tuned over about three years. Um, from a business adoption rate, again, that the success of having a, a business unit come to me two years later and using that terminology is great. From a financial standpoint, we have a customer that had an MRIA. Anybody know what an MRIA is? <laughs> Matters requiring immediate attention. You haven't fixed it in a while. They became our customer in November. Um, we took all hands approach and in three months had built, taking this approach to building the plans and addressing a couple of other things, we addressed the MRA, MRIA and there was no findings. So that was a great success. Um, challenges though is again is, is, is working with certain departments <laughs> and narrowing those down. That is a facilitization thing. That's where you put it on a whiteboard and you start to work with them to, to get it. And one of the secrets, though, is when we do our plans, we use a whiteboard because it's their words. They own it, and we can erase a lot faster than we can type and change and consolidate. Can, can we bring these two things together? You know, because, you know, well, I, I train employees and onboard. Well, isn't that a sense of onboarding and training kind of combined? Oh, yeah, okay, great, let's do that. So th th we've had a lot of success with that. Um, adoption across most of the, most industries have been that way. The only, the only real, the two exceptions is gonna be manufacturing, right? Because if you look on a manufacturing plant, you know, we, we have a, a client that makes the 737s and the Dreamliners, is building that plant on that floor, I've gotta put the detail in. The, the lizard brain doesn't work because I have hourly shifts and I have different skill sets, so it's a lot more of a challenge. Did I answer your question? Okay, great. I'll, I'll work my way back. <laughs> to his point as well, um, I've been doing a similar approach from, you know, to try to diagnose things down to very actionable, very, you know, and I will say we've been doing it for 10 years now. I've got three large organizations that are using this uh, methodology, and we've got 20-something credit unions using this methodology, and it has gotten a thumbs up virtually across the board from every audit that's been done over the course of that period of time. And I had one of my credit union clients come back to me and go, the auditor was here, and they were like, you don't have a plan for, you know, for a flood or a fire or whatever. And I actually wrote the response to the auditor. I said, you've got an overly ambitious auditor. 
that's not file, following their own FFIEC guidelines for what a plan should be. The plan should plan for the impact, not the event. And he wanted her to have 20 binders for a flood, for a power flood like this. And I wrote back and told him to shut up. So you've got to know, you know, if you start and end with what are they looking for, and you've got somebody that's looking for something that's not there, you know, that shouldn't be there, you have to be able to push back and say, no, you're wrong. And they did. They shut up. So. Yeah. Uh, um, and again, it depends on the culture of the industry and, and again, the audit. And we, well, I've always... I, I actually say this honestly, I have always had positive results when we meet with the auditors on behalf of our clients. I think uh, what you're saying is, as well is uh, that there, there might be, a, there's a difference of detail uh, of the plan, what you need to be actionable. You discuss it with the specialists. Yes. And then the summary, which is the highlights, which you, you discuss it with other audience like the department chiefs and the, and the crisis management and the senior management. And it's, it's, you need the detail as well in some areas, mm -hmm. but you don't use it for crisis. And it must be sort of a summary that, of the same, well, of well put. Level, a level of detail. Yeah. Mark, that was well put. You're right. Um, so what, what we see with our plans is, again, for, you think it's for recover. Compliance, I can build around that and add that detail. Um, uh, I meant, to, Peter, to your other question is, the other industry where we see a lot more detail is NERC the Nuclear Energy Re Regulatory Commission. That is extremely uh, detailed. I'm walking back, I saw. I was surprised to see BIA listed in the Lizard Brain Plan. I would just expect it to be a, a background document whose results are reflected in the resources and the RTOs. Listing it seems kind of redundant to me. That's great. So um, it, you're right, and, and, and I'll challenge you. So yes, um, when I talk to BIA in the lizard brain, it's usually going to be the prioritized functions that we've resulted from the BIA. So those five processes are going to be listed in priority order with their RTO. The actual BIA, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'll put, it's a good point. I think I'll move it. <laughs> so how, when you're going through there, do you deal with multiple departments doing the same business function and different priorities? Oh, sure. Give me the hard question. And I actually have, a, I, can, I can relate to that. So um, we have um, a, a diamond grading company and they have offices all over the world to answer your, your, so the question of how do you do it so the same function is being done Mumbai Africa New York and California and it was interesting it was a learning experience and an aha moment for, for myself and senior leadership when they look and the BIAs were all done with different time frames and RTOs. And senior leadership was like, it all should be the same. Oh, I had to, should. I flew out. <laughs> this, was, this was a hard one. And I had to say to them, okay, in New York, if I can't do the function, I've got seven courier services within a half mile of this location. In Mumbai, I have one. The next one is two days away. So they wanted to look at it from an overall corporate perspective, and that was their focus, and they were pushing that, and here I am pushing back on factors that they just didn't see, which came up when we were doing that. So when you have the same business in different locations, I have to take you know, geographic as well as other geopolitical risk factors and other things in doing it, because they're the experts there. And, and it really came down to, right, it's, it's their company, they're going to make the decision. But at least they made it from an educated perspective and we were going to challenge them on it. So did I, did I answer that question? <laughs> Thank you. All right, guys, this side of the room has been really active. Any other questions? No? Well, excellent. So one of the nice things when we do our kickoff meetings, we tell them if you show up on time, I'm going to give you discretionary time. Right? And they love that, because they always show up on time. 
So you guys showed up on time. I'm going to give you guys discretionary time. Thank you very much.